Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian McCollum, and I have five pages of questions here from our awesome Patreon contributors. It is you guys who make this channel possible every day. Uh, so let's just dig right into it. Our first question is from Colin, who says, Of all the guns you've had a chance to handle, which were the most disappointing and which exceeded your expectations? I think I've talked about this a little bit before, but I think it it's worth reiterating. The gun, the single most gun that disappointed me compared to what I expected was the Johnson light machine gun. Um, when I finally had a chance to shoot one, I was pretty excited about it. On paper, the Johnson looks like a really great gun. It's lighter than the BAR, it balances a heck of a lot better than the BAR, you know, good pistol grip, good bipod on it. The side mounted magazine's a little funky, but you know, okay, whatever. That, that's not that big a deal. Um, and handling-wise, the side mag's not really a big deal. But when you actually start shooting that thing, it's really quite unpleasant. Um, it has remarkably harsh recoil to it, more so than I would expect for a rifle, for a machine gun in that caliber and that weight. Uh, and it's not just me. Uh, ever since I did, had that experience, I've talked to other, whenever I get the chance, I ask other Johnson Light machine gun owners if they've shot it, and if so, what they thought of them. And every single owner who has shot their Johnson Light machine gun has told me that, yeah, it kicks like a mule and it's really pretty unpleasant to shoot. Uh, I had the chance to do some shooting with a semi-automatic drawer, which is the Israeli adaptation of the Johnson Light machine gun system to 8mm Mauser. That thing was un had unpleasantly harsh recoil as well, even just in semi-auto. So there's something about, and ab about the, the harmonics, the design of that gun, I think it ha probably has to do with um, the recoil operating system, and I suspect that the the operating components slam into the back of the receiver pretty hard on the Johnson, and that's what contributes to it having a pretty jarring recoil. Uh, on the other side, gun that exceeded my expectations that I can that, that comes to mind would be the Beretta 38A. I had a chance to shoot one and wasn't. I mean, it was. I didn't think it was going to be a bad gun, but I figured it'd just be kind of another generic, typical 9mm submachine gun, when in reality the 38A is one of the top tier 9mm submachine guns out there. Um, it was a lot smoother, a lot more controllable, um, and just a lot nicer than I was anticipating. Uh, very easy gun to shoot. Not, it, It's got some special sauce in it that the later versions of the Beretta, the 3842 and the 3843 and 3844, they just don't quite stack up the same way. Uh, part of that might be the weight at the front end, but I think it's also largely to do with the design of the bolt and recoil spring, which did change uh, between the early and late versions. Uh, the late versions are very basic, simple, fixed firing pin sort of bolt, where the early version actually has a, a moving firing pin that's only tripped when the bolt actually closes. So there's something in that that really makes it a nicer gun to shoot. Our next question is from Matthew. Uh, Matthew Browning. Probably not the same Matthew Browning. Uh, I think he's dead. Was there any particular reason the US kept the 1903 Springfield as their service rifle after World War I instead of just adopting the 1917? Good question. Uh, that did come up. The US had more 1917s in World War I than 1903s. I think arguably, in my opinion at least, the 1917 is a better gun. However, the Army did deliberately choose to stick with the 1903. And part of this, a large part of it, was infrastructure. Uh, they had the training uh, equipment, they had the training manuals, they had um, all of the spare parts infrastructure in inventory. They had, maybe equally important, they had the manufacturing capability in-house at Springfield to make the 1903, where the 1917s were all done by commercial outside contractors. The 1917 originated as the British pattern 1914 rifle, uh, which was then just modified over to 30 out 6 and sold to the US um, because it was already in production and it was an easy modification to do. After the war, the US government I think was more interested in making sure that it maintained its own manufacturing capability and it already had everything for the Springfield, so they stuck with the Springfield. Now, did that really have that much impact? No, probably not. Um, the modification to an aperture rear sight that would come on the Springfield uh, made up a lot of the, the difference between it and the 1917. Not everything, but closed the gap substantially. And the, the, the bolt action rifles, the 03 Springfield, was really on its way out when World War II started. So I don't think it would have made that big of a difference. 
Uh, next question is from Daniel. It says, were Bren guns ever produced in 30-06? How difficult would it be to convert a pre-existing 303 Bren to 30-06? Um, there were actually two different instances of 30-06 caliber Bren guns being made. Uh, one was Italy after World War II. They did so experimentally, um, and they ended up dropping the project. They moved to 7.62 NATO with the BM-59, um, and they, that, that never went anywhere. Uh, more substantially, the Taiwanese military manufactured the Bren gun uh, in 30-06. They were using 30-06 as their standard military cartridge at the time. They designated this the Type 41, and it went into production in 1952. I don't know exactly how many were made. Uh, there are like two came into the US as parts kits. They're extremely rare here. Um, I don't. I suspect not a whole lot were made, and as far as I know, they're all still in Taiwan, probably in some bunker or warehouse, just in case. Now, as for converting a 303 brand to 30 at 6, it's going to be an extremely difficult task. Um, the major difference is that the receiver was lengthened for both the Taiwanese and the Italian versions of the 30 at 6 brand. The magazine well just isn't long enough to accommodate a 30 at 6 cartridge um, as it was designed in either 303 or 8 millimeter. So you need to cut the receiver and stretch it, which is an interesting, that's a, that's a challenging task for sure. Uh, the Taiwanese manufactured these from scratch, so they made a number of other changes to the design, and they just made their own receivers that were a little bit longer and could accommodate it. Um, you will also need a magazine. The Taiwanese adapted, basically took the 8mm, the ZB26 mag, stretched it out a little bit to make it compatible with 30-06. If you're looking at doing this on a, a one-off you know, home project basis, there aren't a whole lot of 30 6 caliber magazines out there. Uh, BAR magazines are not really going to lock into the gun the same way that a Bren gun mag did. So you're looking at a very challenging project to make one from a 303 Bren. Uh, Shane says, with the release of your book Chaspo to FAMAS, which is, by the way, available for pre-order now, uh, we are, at the time you see this, uh, the entire thing will be off at the printers. Finally, uh, the, the editing and layout process uh, took a little longer than I anticipated, but man, it came out looking really good. So I'm pretty excited about it. Especially excited to have, have it sent off to the printer and in progress now. So hopefully um, about two months, if I know exactly when this video is going to publish, about two months, we should have, video, have books um, ready to ship out. Anyway. Uh, Shane is asking, any chance for a book on the sidearms, specifically handguns, maybe blades or bayonets of the French army from the same time period? Hmm, probably not. Not from me, anyway. So there are a couple of books out there on French service handguns. Uh, I will link to them uh, in the description text. There, at least one of them is out of print, but there are decent good books. I think they could be made nicer, they could be done bigger, all in color, a little more detail, but I'm trying to focus on stuff where the information is less accessible to begin with. As for bayonets, I do actually have a section on bayonets in every chapter of my rifle book. So a uh, pretty good overview of all the bayonets that were used will be in that book already. Um, there are books out there on bayonets. There's one in a small sort of pamphlet magazine style of book printed in French on French bayonets if you're really interested in it. Uh, Norman says, I would like to know more about your education and jobs before you went digital. No need to mention companies, just experience. Well, um, as I've mentioned before, I have a degree in mechanical engineering technology from Purdue University. Uh, I, after I got that, I ended up kind of moving out into the boonies um, and did a variety of sort of odd jobs before I fell into something that, that worked out a little better. So um, I spent a year or two as a small engine mechanic working on mostly generators and chainsaws. Like I said, I was out, out in the middle of nowhere doing that. Uh, in fact, it was I almost didn't get that job because I had a degree that sounded like an engineering degree, and the shop owner was uh, leery and untrustful of engineers, uh, but I did end up getting in the shop. Um, the kind of nice thing was I was the only person in there who was really super comfortable with electricity. So I got all the generator, the electrical generator repairs, which were cool because those were nice uh, lucrative jobs to do. Um, after that, uh, I moved into a little bit more populated area. I had a job for a short time installing garage doors. That was not my favorite thing ever. Um, and I ended up transitioning from that into bartending. 
uh, bartended for several years. Uh, I actually used my bartending gig to pay off my student loans, which was nice and probably not what Purdue intends you to do with an MET degree. Um, after that, I my my most recent my last real job before uh, doing Forgotten Weapons full time, I was actually inside sales director for a, a solar power company. It was a company that made mounting systems for solar panels. So uh, we did everything from you know putting a kilowatt on a residential rooftop up to multi megawatt ground mount installations. It was it was an interesting job. Um, the, the subject matter was interesting, the, there were elements of the job that were less interesting. In fact, it got less interesting as I got promoted because uh, when, once I hit inside sales director, my job became basically taking on all the really problematic customers that the staff of sales guys uh, weren't, weren't you know, fully capable of handling. And so you know, my life turned into dealing with problem customers. Anyway, after that, um, I left that job to do Forgotten Weapons full time, and this is definitely my favorite job of the bunch. Uh, next up, Daniel says, 30 carbine handguns were a thing after World War II. Was there any attempt to produce a 30 carbine handgun during the war? No, definitely not. Uh, a complete no, um, because that wasn't, that would have been like 180 degrees contrary to the purpose of the 30 carbine cartridge. The 30 carbine was developed to Basically, give, take to replace the the 1911 handguns for a lot of people. The problem was if you had a guy whose job wasn't whose primary job wasn't shooting people, um, and you he's, he's going to have less marksmanship training, less weapons training than standard line infantry guys. Well, you're arming him with a pistol, which is the hardest gun to shoot effectively and accurately. So, the the whole point of 30 carbine was let's come up with a lightweight, easy to shoot carbine that will basically fill the same role as the 1911 um, for guys like drivers, clerks, supply guys, logistics guys, all these people who don't need to be toting around a full-size M1 Garand. If you were to take the 30 carbine and roll it back into a handgun, you'd end up with something that was even harder to shoot than the 1911, uh, because the 30 carbine cartridge is definitely more substantial than a pistol round. So. Um, and I think that's really the, the reason that the 30 carbine never took off as a handgun round after the war. Yes, there were some, um, but it's really a pretty overpowered round for a pistol and not particularly pleasant to shoot and hard to shoot well. Thomas says, any update on Starline French Long Brass? Yes, if you haven't uh, seen it yet, and a whole ton of people have sent it to me, so I appreciate it you guys, although I do know about it at this point. Uh, Starline is now manufacturing and selling uh, in bulk French 7.65 long French French long brass, uh, and darn cheap. Like if you buy a thousand rounds of it, it's 18 cents a piece, which is awesome. So that's right in line with all sorts of other uh, mass-produced commercial brass. Uh, it is no longer the dollar or dollar fifty a round stuff that's all hand converted from other cartridges. I'm really excited about it. Um, I have a batch of it from Starline, and because I have been traveling extensively in the last couple of months, I've not had a chance to do anything with it yet. So it looks good. Everything I've heard from people so far is very positive. Uh, I look forward to being able to get some loaded up, both for my Moss 38 submachine gun and also for the 1935A and S pistols. I'm really stoked about this. Uh, if you guys are out there, if you have 1935 pistols or a Moss 38 submachine gun, um, this is a great opportunity to get brass and actually be able to load up for those pistols and get them shooting, which is something that's been very difficult in the past because of the lack of ammunition availability. So uh, very, very cool of Starline to do that. Um, I talked to them like two years ago, probably 18 months ago now at SHOT Show, and they said they were gonna, and lo and behold, they came through and they have. Uh, Kevin says, is there an objectively bad or ridiculous gun that you love anyway despite having every reason not to? Absolutely, the Shosha. Um, it is objectively one of the most difficult, least comfortable machine guns out there to shoot, but I love it anyway uh, for its historical significance. That was the most most produced uh, automatic weapon of the entire First World War. It was the armament, uh, a key piece of armament for both the French Army and the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, there were a bunch of guys, really a handful of guys, who uh, were awarded the Medal of Honor for actions using. Shosha uh, automatic rifles, and I think it's really cool to have them. Have one of them. 
uh, two of them actually, one in each caliber, uh, and they're. I think the experience of shooting them is fantastic. I don't need that gun to be competitive with something that's you know well well developed and mass produced today. It's it's a very cool gun. It doesn't have to be a great gun. Um, it doesn't have to be a great shooting gun to be a very significant and very cool piece of history. Joseph says, I recently purchased a relatively good quality pistol scope and noticed that the eye relief was quite long and quite forgiving. What dictates the eye relief in a magnified optic? Is it something to do with the glass, the body, or the manufacturing quality in general? Uh, there are two different things I think we need to distinguish between here. Um, you have eye relief and you have eye box. So eye relief is how far back from the scope your eye is supposed to go so that you can see the full sight picture. So a pistol scope is designed so that you put your arms out at full extension and scopes out here on the pistol and you can still see it from you know back where your head is. If you take a rifle scope and you hold it out that far you'll notice that you can't see anything. What's happening of course is that the scope is focusing, it's gathering light from, from let's say that end and it's focusing it down and spitting it out the back end in a cone and where that cone comes to a point is where you put your eye and where you can see uh, what's at the other end of the scope. So it's a matter of simply lens design to, like you can choose, you can have any eye relief you want on a scope. Uh, typically rifle scopes have one to four inches somewhere in that range because that's how far you're typically putting your face from the scope. Pistol scopes being designed for a different application have a different eye relief to match it. Uh, Eye relief has nothing to do with manufacturing quality. Now eye box is a little bit different, um, also something to pay attention to. Eye box is how much wiggle room basically you have in where you can put your eye. So <clears throat> say eye relief is three inches on the scope, well large, a large eye box would mean maybe I can put my eye at four or four and a half inches and I can still see a good full picture through the scope. or you know. Two inches, one and a half inches. A very small eye box means I have to be, uh, I have less tolerance. I have to be closer to that exact eye relief in order to get a full picture through the scope. That's also something that can be chosen. So uh, you can take basically that, that cone that comes out, a cone of light that comes out of the scope, you can determine how big it is. Does it come to a sharp point or is it open a little bit more? The, the more open that is, the more area you have for your eye to be in, whether it's forward or backward or left, right, up, down, um, and still get a full sight picture. However, the bigger the eye box is, to some extent, the less light you're getting because that light's being distributed through a larger area that your eye can be in. A very small eye box means you, put, you have to put your eye in exactly the right spot, but once you do, you're getting 100% of the light coming through the scope. So there, there's some trade-offs in there. And again, eye box is not necessarily uh, dictated by overall manufacturing quality. You can kind of choose what sort of what size eye box you want to have in the scope. John says, uh, are there any prototype guns you've handled that you thought had better features than the weapon that went into production? Something other than the SA-80. Yeah, the SA-80 is a great example because the prototype versions, the XL-70 and XL-60, were much better guns than the uh, L-85, the SA-80 that eventually was adopted. But it's not that uncommon to see technological elements in a, a prototype firearm that are cool and, and useful and effective that get dropped from the final production, generally for reasons of cost. Um, I think one good example would be the, the muzzle device on the very first AR-10 rifles. It was this titanium combination muzzle brake and sort of suppressor, um, and it was a really expensive thing to make because it was titanium and it was a complicated piece of, a set of complicated parts. And so by the time the gun went into full scale production, they just dropped it. Like it works, it's cool, it's not cost effective, it's the wrong compromise to have on this design. So we'll get rid of it. Um, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but I know there are a bunch of other features like that. Um, and that's generally what it is. Too expensive, gets ditched before the gun goes into full scale production. Let's see. Uh, Lost and Gone asks, have I ever met Oleg Volk, the photographer, or worked with him? Yes, actually I have. Um, I pretty much run into him every year at SHOT Show. And several years back, boy, probably five or six years back now, maybe even more than that, 
um, we collaborated on a video about the Garat 06 and 06H, the last ditch uh, German roller delayed and roller locked rifles. Uh, so if you check out that video, which I'll have linked at the end here, um, Oleg did all of the, the videography on that. So it was kind of an early project for us both. I didn't have a lot of experience at the time, and Oleg was just getting into video work. So it's a video that I think we could do better today, but it was a fun experience to do that. Daniel says, why do you think the 1907 didn't gain more popularity as opposed to the Remington Model 8? He's referring, I assume, to the Winchester Model 1907 self-loader. Um, it was relatively popular, but it didn't directly compete with uh, the Remington 8. So it's a heavy gun uh, because it is a simple blowback gun, where the Remington is a, a locked breech, Remington's long recoil. Remington uses a substantially more powerful cartridge, so the sort of game hunting that the, the Remington Model 8 was developed for isn't really the sort of thing you were going to do with a Winchester 1907. Um, Winchester was definitely a cheaper gun, but uh, yeah, they're not really direct competitors. Austin says, are you still working on your French collection, or do you plan to move on to collecting something else now that your book on French rifles is done? Nope, I'm still very much interested in the French collection, um, and I continue to improve it when I have the opportunity. Um, I will be. I have a couple couple topics in mind for the next book, um, which may or may not involve me trying to build a collection, uh, a, you know, a relevant collection for those books on my own. Some of them are things I would photograph um, at other, from other collections, other people who've already put that that material together. Uh, Christopher says, I am heading to Paris for a few days in November. Do you have any suggestions on places to visit that focus on the French resistance during German occupation? Uh, any other interesting off-the-beaten-path stops would be great as well. Um, actually, so no, I, I don't have any good suggestions for French resistance landmarks or places to visit in Paris, but I would be very interested to find out about them. So I'm sure one of you guys out there watching, or probably several of you, know of just that sort of place, and I would love to hear from you in the comments about where should one, uh, what, what are some cool, maybe not so well known uh, places to visit in Paris focusing on things like the Resistance during World War II. Um, so Christopher, check out the comments as well, and hopefully we'll hear from some folks about some good places to go. Uh, Derek says, why did France bother with the development and adoption of the FAMAS instead of just developing short-barreled AR-15s? Good question. Easy answer. The French did test the, uh, well, test the M16. Uh, they did not adopt it because it was not capable of handling the heavy rifle grenades that they wanted to use. Uh, Edward says, in your opinion, which pistol was more influential, the Glock 17 or the Walther P38? Interesting question. Um, the Walther has two things going for it. One is the double action trigger mechanism, and the other is the pivoting wedge locking system. Glock, I would say, is basically going to, its influence would be in using a polymer frame. It wasn't the first to do that, but it was certainly the one that really made it a breakout success. P38's kind of the same way. It's not the first uh, double action pistol, uh, far, far from it. In fact, uh, it's not even Walther's first double action pistol, but it kind of was the first one to really uh, make a, a double action service pistol a popular thing. However, I think the double action is less relevant, less influential, because of course double action revolvers had been around for decades. Everyone was familiar with the concept. It was just application to a, a semi-automatic pistol, in fact, a semi-automatic service pistol. Uh, that was a little bit novel at the time, and the the locking system of the Walther really only developed along one kind of linear branch. It went from the Walther P38 to the Beretta company, uh, and through a couple iterations at Beretta, resulting eventually in the M92 today. Overall, I think that's less relevant than the Glock. Um, if you look at the number of guns that have uh, take an inspiration from Glock for the polymer frame uh, and the general mechanical uh, assembly that Glock did, it's far more. So I will go with the Glock as the more influential pistol over the P38. Do you disagree? If you do, let me know in the comments. Um, Gary says, in modern bolt rifles, is there a real advantage or is there a real or necessary advantage in controlled round feed 
uh, like Mauser, over push feed. Does controlled feed still have a modern application? So uh, just in a nutshell, the difference between the two is in a controlled feed rifle, as soon as the round comes up out of the magazine to feed, it is captured underneath the extractor of the bolt, and it is, well, as the name implies, it is controlled. It is uh, physically hooked to the bolt until all the way until the cartridge is actually ejected out of the rifle. In a push feed, the round is, it comes up out of the magazine, and it's kind of loose, free and loose, until uh, the bolt locks into battery, at which point the extractor snaps over the rim of the cartridge. There is a very real advantage to controlled feed. Um, well, there are two. So they're both fairly small application areas. One of them is it's possible to cause a malfunction in a push feed rifle. If you start closing the bolt, but you don't lock it all the way and you open it back up, you can leave a round in the chamber and then you'll cause a double feed if you cycle a new round in. With a controlled feed rifle, if you don't close the, the bolt all the way, or even if you do close the bolt all the way, as soon as you open the bolt back, you're pulling the cartridge with it. So you can't, you, you won't get a double feed in a way that is possible with a push feed rifle. Um, kind of a corollary to that is there is hypothetically the possibility of an out of battery detonation with a push feed rifle. If you do this, if you push around almost all the way into the chamber, but not quite, open the bolt and then cycle it again, if you push a Spitzer pointed bullet up into the center of the primer of a round that's already in the barrel, and you do it with enough force, you could hypothetically detonate that cartridge and cause a, a real problem. Does that happen very often? No. Does it happen hardly at all? Like, no, hardly at all. I don't know that I've ever... I can't think of an example, a specific example. It is technically possible, though. Um, the advantage to push feed is it's cheaper and simpler to make, and so that's why a lot of the modern bolt-action rifles are push feed designs, because there's the, the, the chances of the push feed causing a problem are so slim that the cost benefit to them is more important. Do, do, do. Where do we get to here? Next up is Cody. Cody says, uh, do you have any foreseeable plans to do, to do another video on the Ross rifle, and will you be able to get your hands on a Huot automatic rifle like Bloke on the Range did? Yes. In fact, it's funny you should ask, because um, I recently completed a week-long trip in Canada where I did a ton of filming. I have about, probably about a dozen different videos on different iterations of the Ross. Um, we're not going to publish them all at once, but there is a bunch of Ross content coming over the next 6 to 12 months, and I also got my hands on a Huot. So we have a really good video on the Huot that I'm really happy about. That'll be coming in the next couple of months as well. Uh, Josie says, I've heard and read a lot of things about how good the Finnish Mosin Nagants were compared to the Russian ones. Were all the Finnish Mosins rebuilt Russian guns, or did the Finns actually make new Mosins as well? Just how much effort would they put into rebuilding them? Did they go so far as to use all new parts except the receiver? Yeah, they kind of did. Um, so first off, the Finns never made uh, their own receivers. They used only existing Russian and also American, because a bunch of the, well, maybe not a bunch, a substantial minority of the Mosins that ended up in Finnish hands were actually manufactured during World War I by Remington and New England Westinghouse. Uh, in fact, there are theoretically there are some Chatelereau Mosins that got into Finnish hands as well, but I digress. The Finns used only captured or purchased Russian Mosins, um, and they did by the end. By the time you get to 1939, they were replacing almost everything in the gun. So along the way they made some changes to the magazine, they made some changes to the bolts, they then, they were, one of the main things they were doing was replacing barrels, so new barrel. They replaced stocks. Uh, sometimes they modified existing stocks, sometimes they replaced them with brand new ones. So by the time you get to an M39, it's got a new barrel, a new stock, uh, new sights. So you're looking at maybe some of the bolt components and the receiver, maybe the trigger, are original mosin nagant parts. Not a whole lot. Um, and I think they did that simply because they had factories that were tooled up to do it. Originally it was repair and refurbishment of Russian Mosins, and then they started getting into modifying the design themselves at that point. It is a cheaper process than buying all new rifles, so why not? Robert says, it seems to me that all semi-auto handguns today have the same blocky silhouette and general shape. Why did slimmed down designs like the Walther P38, the Savage 1907, or the Astro 400 fall out of style? Were they flawed? 
they weren't necessarily flawed, but they weren't the most efficient as the market has come to determine it. So the reason that those pistols that you list are, have a different shape to them is that they have a different locking system. Um, the P38 has a tilting wedge thing um, that's located below the barrel, which allows it to have a, a sleeker profile up top. The Savage has a rotating barrel, uh, which again allows it to have a sleeker profile up top, and the Sav and the Astra is just simple blowback, so it doesn't have any locking system at all. Again, slicker profile up top. There are some guns on the market today that use some of those systems, but as you observed, the majority of guns out there are kind of blocky looking. That's because the majority of handguns out there are browning tilting barrel types, where you have a, a barrel that's locking up either into recesses in the top of the slide or into the, the front of the ejection port itself, and that requires more mass up in the top of the slide, which gives you this sort of blocky, uh, well, it gives you a bulkier design, and the most efficient way to manufacture those is generally in a sort of squared off blocky manner. Patrick says, hey Ian, I was wondering how you liked the Kickstarter process for the pre-release of your book. Were there any particularly annoying aspects of the process you had to work around? After your experience with Kickstarter, do you think that the other two books you're in the process that are in the process of being written um, will go through a similar process? There, uh, there were a few things. So that Kickstarter campaign took more of my time than I anticipated it would. It was something that really required a lot of daily attention. I didn't get a whole lot of other work done during that pre-sale, which is totally fine considering how successful that, that pre-sale was. Um, there are some elements to Kickstarter behind the scenes that you don't see as a, as a uh, funder, but you do see as a project creator. In a lot of ways Kickstarter is a very old platform that's still around and hasn't gone through much updating, so things like um, changing addresses in, in your Kickstarter database. You know, I've got thousands of people who pre-ordered books, if someone decide, if someone moves between when we do the Kickstarter and when we actually ship the book, changing that address, updating information like that in Kickstarter is very clumsy. That's why we ended up using Backerkit um, as kind of a, a plastered on add-on uh, above and beyond Kickstarter. Backerkit makes a lot of those things simpler. Um, some of the other things like um, if you have someone whose credit card bounces, you know, oh, they, they put a typo in the credit card thing, or again, between when they make a pledge and when it's actually charged, their credit card changes, things like that are difficult to deal with in Kickstarter. They're not handled very efficiently. All that being said, it was overall a good experience, and I expect that we will continue to use it. I really like the idea of being able to use a pre-sale to fund the printing cost of the book. Um, the one thing I will probably do next time, at least on my own book, is have have the layout and the editing a little more complete before we do a pre-sale. Um, it's been a bit of a, a stressor doing that once after the pre-sale while we're on the clock, uh, so to speak. But that's not Kickstarter's fault. So uh, yeah, I have every expectation that we will use Kickstarter for future book releases. Will says, we know the SNAB system was a wacky bolt action to semi-auto conversion, and there are various other different attempts to get semi-auto conversions adopted, other than the Charlton, which was a semi, uh, actually a select fire um, conversion of the, the Lee Metford, were there any that made it into similar limited adoption? No. Um, the Charlton is the only one I can think of that actually saw official adoption, and even the Charlton didn't see any actual use. It's just, the, the problem is just that those guns are all clunky. Um, they're subpar for handling and for reliability as semi-automatic rifles, and every government that basically ever tested them out came to the conclusion that they could spend the same money or not very much more money and get a substantially better gun uh, if they went with something that was designed from the ground up as a semi-automatic. Uh, Justin says, in your first Q&A you stated that your preferred Civil War carbine was the Spencer. Given your time on the what would the the lever gun project on InRange, uh, would you keep that answer? No, probably not. Um, on paper, the Spencer looks good. The more shooting I've done with the Spencer, the less good it kind of looks. And I think I completely understand why the U.S. Cavalry replaced it with a trapdoor um, after a couple years after the Civil War. If I were in the Civil War, 
um, and had my choice of carbines, I think I would probably take a Henry with the caveat of knowing that the Henry is a relatively fragile gun, um, certainly compared to the other systems that are out there. The US military did not adopt the Henry for specific and ultimately pretty decent reasons. It was, it was a fragile gun. You have potential to damage the magazine tube, the sights are not particularly robust. Uh, it's fine for the individual sporting user uh, and the individual civilian user who's probably going to take better care of it as a line infantry rifle or cavalry rifle. I understand why they didn't adopt it. Um, it would have had problems in the field, I can pretty much guarantee it. But if it's just me, I know I can take care of a Henry well enough uh, to keep it running. Henry would be my choice. It does offer by a huge margin the most firepower of any of the carbines available in the Civil War. Let's see, Patrick says, why aren't there more designs with constant recoil system like the Knight's Armament LAMG or the Ultimax 100? Very good question. Um, I think it comes down to, first off, constant recoil is only really w useful in a gun that's being fired in full auto. Constant recoil, semi-auto, just doesn't give you anything. You don't notice it's there, you don't get a benefit from it. So when we consider what guns are we surprised don't have constant recoil built into them, you can get rid of every infantry shoulder rifle. Like there's no good necessary reason to have a constant recoil M16 because that's a rifle that's primarily fired in semi-auto uh, for all sorts of reasons, like ammo supply, um, as well as single shot accuracy. So it's only squad automatic weapons um, and heavy machine guns that would make use of it. And in fact, we can get rid of the heavy machine guns as well. If the thing's on a tripod or on a pintle mount, again, you kind of lose the benefit of uh, constant recoil. You don't need it to, you don't need to get rid of the, the individual recoil impulses because you've bolted the thing down onto some very large mount and you're not, like they're not causing a problem anyway. So it's only, we end up with this little narrow field of basically squad automatic weapons and light machine guns that can really benefit from constant recoil. Now look at, at that group of guns. There aren't a whole lot of new ones out there. Most of the ones that are, are popular are ones that are well proven, um, things like the FN Mini-Me um, or the M240, FN240, that those have been in service for a long time, so it's kind of understandable why they didn't have this system built in in the first place. Like constant recoil wasn't really a thing when a lot of those guns were being developed. And now to have a gun with constant recoil, you need to have a brand new gun. Well, you're gonna to have to convince a military to abandon something that's well proven and replace it with something that's brand new. And that's a tricky proposition. I think you put all those factors together, that's why you don't see constant recoil out there much more. All right, our next question comes from Brock, who says, why did the ASP's gutter snipe sights not see use in pistols other than the ASP? Uh, it seems like it would be really effective for modern subcompact pistols we have today, so what gives? Honestly, I think it's just that they weren't that much better than not having sights. Uh, it's not a precision sight, it was designed to kind of draw your eye into this channel on top of the slide, and I think when you get right down to it, people either aren't using the sight at all, and thus it doesn't matter, or that, that idea of the contoured channel doesn't really gain you much more than just looking right down the top of the slide, as you could with pistols going back, boy, almost 100 years that just have a, you know, the, before you had gutter snipe, as they call them, sights, you had just a long single trough along the top of a pistol slide. And uh, I think that works just as well. So why spend the extra money and complexity machining a special gutter snipe on top instead of just something simpler that does the job. Uh, Robert says, congratulations or condolences. You've just been put in charge of the process to replace the G36 for the Bundeswehr. How would you design tests to best highlight the differences between the contenders and avoid common pitfalls of these sorts of trials? Well, I think there are two issues going on here, and it is how do you design testing criteria for a military rifle, and also what's the deal with the G36? The problem with the G36 is it got put into a condition that was not part of its acceptance trials and didn't do so hot, uh, but it was really beyond the scope of what the gun was required to do in the first place. So if you want the rifle to be able to dump an entire combat load of like 300 rounds, 
as quickly as possible and not suffer any ill effects, that has to be part of the design requirement for the gun. And it means you're going to have a heavier gun. You're going to have heavier parts. You're going to have a heavier barrel. Part of what made the G36 really nice with its inexpensive and lightweight construction was due to the fact that it wasn't required to do something like that. Um, and in the vast majority of circumstances, it wasn't called upon to do it by soldiers. So you, in the design phase, you have to balance, like, you can have a gun that's 100% reliable and 100%, like, and it can run a thousand rounds at a time without switching barrels or without taking any breaks. But there are consequences to that in terms of weight and size and handling. On the other hand, you can have a gun that weighs five pounds and, um, and, and you know, you can carry around on your back and not even notice that it's there, but you're going to have problems in terms of sustained fire and how quickly the thing overheats. And depending on how light you make it, how long it can run before parts start breaking. So it's not so much to my mind a matter of figuring out the right tests, it's a matter of figuring out what the design parameters are. What does the gun have to do? Once you know that, once you've decided on that, then it's fairly easy to design tests to see if a gun can do it. So if you have a sustained fire requirement, that's your test. You know, Get a dozen examples, put them all through that amount of sustained fire and see what happens. If the gun can handle it, you'll see that in the tests. Now it gets a little more complicated with like reliability tests where the question is what artificial circumstances do you put the gun in that you think are going to accurately reflect the sort of circumstances it will get in in the field. And that's where things like the mud testing that Carl and I do comes into play. Is that test going to be specifically replicated by some soldier in the field? Uh, maybe in some very rare occasion, but generally no. Um, our hope with that is that it is an excessive test that allows us to weed out all but the very best guns. Like, If you design an excessive test like that, you know that the guns that pass it are really good. Um, if you design a more realistic test, you will get guns that will pass it. And this again, this comes back right, right to the sustained fire sort of thing again. If, you, if your sustained fire requirement is 150 rounds, a lot of guns are going to pass that. But then at some point someone will get into the situation where they dump 300 and the gun melts. Uh, same thing with reliability. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna submerge the whole thing in mud. Most guys aren't gonna do that. But eventually maybe someone will. If you want, it, it all depends on, again, what is your design parameter? What does the gun have to survive? Zachary says, how did the United States compare to Europe, like UK, France, and Prussia, in small arms technology at the start and the end of the Civil War? Uh, how much did the need to maintain a functional supply chain disrupt developments or advances? Do you think lever guns would have had a fairer shot at being adopted uh, if the war hadn't happened or had happened later? Interesting couple of questions. So um, I would say the US was on par with Europe in terms of firearms technology at the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, and in fact a lot of the major developments were coming out of the United States. Guns like the Henry, early rimfire, uh, cartridge firing, repeating. Uh, rifles, early revolvers. Um, Colt, you know, Colt and Winchester were on the the tip of the spear, uh, bleeding edge technology when they came out, and they were both American firms. In the Civil War, however, the U.S. military took a very deliberate and very specific stance of eschewing the new technology, um, specifically when it came to repeating rifles, and that was deliberately because of supply chain reasons. They did not want to be held hostage to a complex new manufacturing line or manufacturing process. They wanted to stick to rifles that were well in hand. You know, we know how to manufacture single shot percussion rifles and muskets. We can do it quickly. We can do it effectively. The quality controls down. There are no strange questions about it. We can manufacture the ammo. We're not worrying about what if we run out of the right alloy of brass or the right alloy of copper. There were copper cartridge cases for a little while. Um, what if we run out of primer material? Because these primers are not the same as percussion caps. They're similar, but you have the potential to introduce a lot of production bottlenecks and quality control issues when you introduce new technology during, uh, during a war. And so the US was willing to adopt carbines for cavalry use, but basically said no to all of them on an infantry basis. And in maybe, maybe there could have been some advantages to troops who had been able to get more modern equipment. 
but they certainly they met the reason for that decision. Um, there weren't like there absolutely would have been more supply chain problems, and they were able to largely avoid that by sticking to known proven technology. Alex says, my question is, were there any gadgets, widgets, or doodahs invented to increase the number of rounds in a revolver? I ask this as I've released, recently replayed a game called Bioshock, and in that game the revolver gets an upgrade from 6 to 24 shots. No. Um, someone is going to post a picture of that revolver that has six cylinders on a big meta cylinder. That's a one-off sort of thing that someone made, that's not a production gun. When it came to actual commercial production, there were there were efforts made, or there were options out there for higher capacity revol revolvers. They did it by making the cylinder bigger and stuffing more cartridges into it, um, especially in smaller caliber guns like 22, 25, 28, 31 caliber revolvers, 32 caliber revolvers when you get to cartridges. Those you'll find guns with 8, 10, maybe 12 shot cylinders. And then they also, in a few situations, mostly little shops in Liège, would make multi-barrel revolvers. So you'd have a cylinder that actually had two uh, concentric rings of, of uh, chambers in the cylinder. And so that's a way you could get like a 20 shot revolver, because you had a top barrel and a bottom barrel and you had 10 rounds in each, uh, each concentric ring of chambers. But those were all guns that were developed from scratch as that. They weren't modifications to pre-existing revolvers. All right, moving on, our next question is from Ron, who says, what would you recommend as the first 8mm LaBelle rifle to add to my collection as far as cost, fun, and cool factor? I would like a 1916 Berthier carbine, are they all 5 round or some 3 round, and is the PPU 8mm LaBelle ammo safe to use in these? So we'll start with the ammo. Yes, um, there were two different cartridges basically speaking, that the French were using in Labelles and Berthiers. Uh, one is, uh, the one that you'll see marked is ball N, um, and this required the chambers to be reamed out a little bit. So sur most French surplus Labelle ammo um, is 1932 N. You do not want to use it in any gun that isn't marked with an N on the chamber and the receiver. However, uh, PPU has designed their ammunition to the 1898 pattern that came before, which can be fired in both converted and unconverted guns just fine. Early on, uh, PPU ammo did not have the extra little groove in the, the case head uh, for use in the label. They do now, so it's great. You can shoot PPU 8 label in any, any otherwise functional label or Berthier. As for the rifle, I think you're on the right track with the 1916 carbine. Um, the 1916 guns, which are the ones with the five round magazines, are definitely the most common out there, um, and especially the most cost effective. You'll find both carbines and rifles um, with five round magazines. The, the Labelle has gone up quite a lot in price of late. Um, there are, so the, the early three round Berthiers were in many cases converted to the new five round pattern but not all of them. So there are three round Berthiers you'll find out there. The five rounder gives you two extra rounds. Um, the five round clips are a little bit easier to find, I think, uh, and they're cheaper guns. So yeah, I think a good, uh, what you'll most likely find is a 1920s, 1930s refurb of a 1916 carbine, and it should be a great little shooter. They kick a fair bit, um, but they're a really good example of a gun that was still in use with the French military going into World War II. Uh, Nicholas says, why have we not seen any firearms reusing the Farqua Hill uh, spring buffered piston system? It seems like a pretty good idea, it doesn't seem to be all that hard to manufacture. It is, however, I think not really necessary today. The, the reason that that system was put into practice was to safely and effectively deal with wide, variety, wide variation in ammunition pressure. So you could have an over, over pressure cartridge, fire it, and it wouldn't damage the gun and it would still um, cycle correctly. Well, that's not really that big of an issue today, especially for military forces who are the ones who are funding uh, a lot of the new self-loading firearms design. They're going to be making all their own ammunition in their own factories or subcontracting it from people whose quality control they can carefully monitor. And the ammunition variability issues that you were looking at in the 1920s, 
not they're just not really a thing today. So if you don't really need this extra functionality, it may not be that expensive to make, but it's certainly more expensive than not having it in the gun at all. Becca Sky says the MG42 seems to be a highly regarded general purpose machine gun. It is. It is a fantastic general purpose machine gun. Uh, why did the US Ordnance Department dismiss it as not worth pursuing while Rheinmetall reverse engineered it and the Bundeswehr adopted it as the MG3 and is only now phasing it out? Uh, actually, the US Ordnance Department did experiment with converting the MG42 into 30 6 caliber. It is a remarkable example of a very poor attempt at such a thing, and they actually just goofed some of the measurements and made the ejection port too small to handle a live cartridge. Um, it was a thoroughly screwed up adoption or you know testing and conversion process, and it certainly for a little while spoiled the uh, the idea. Like it could have been possible, but you try it once and it doesn't work, and then. The rest of the, the bureaucratic system, it's harder to convince them to, oh, we didn't do it quite right, let's try it again. They're much more likely to just move on to, to the next idea instead. In addition, uh, the US didn't do a lot with the sort of heavy stampings uh, that the MG42 was designed around. So it wasn't necessarily a gun that was perfectly well suited to the US um, military industrial base at the time. Uh, ultimately, the US uh, developed the M60, and they did that using the feed system from the MG42. So they did take a substantial element uh, from that gun, and then they just combined it with basically the action from the Lewis gun turned FG42. Uh, Benjamin says, what exactly was the journey of the M14 from its unadoption as standard frontline infantry rifle to its modern incarnation as the EBR? Basically, the M14. The reason the M14 stuck around was through its use as a sniping rifle. Um, it was developed the the M21 and then the M25. The U.S. never really had a sniper rifle. Well, for a long time, didn't have a sniper rifle version of the M16. Instead, they had the M21, which was an M14 with a scope and accurized, and that was the sniper's rifle. So, through Vietnam, that was the sniping rifle, and that kind of stuck around. Nothing really replaced it. And then once you got into the 1980s, some of the Special Forces units started looking for a 7.62 rifle, and the M14 was the thing that was still there in inventory. So it really is a gun that was in the right place for a long time. Not the best gun for the job, it was the gun that was available for the job. And so that's, that's why it kind of then got pushed into other roles, well, pushed in further developed for that special uh, marksmanship sort of role. Tim says, what do you think of the PRC, the People Republic of China, military small arms? It seems they've been historically behind on development. Is that still the case? Do you have a favorite and least favorite Chinese gun? I'm not really in a good position to make a lot of comment on this, as I have very little experience with the current, uh, current stock of Chinese small arms. Um, I've seen a few of them. The QBZ-95 is, to my mind, pretty thoroughly unimpressive. Um, the CF-98 pistol is eh. Like, it's fine, but it's nothing special. Um, I know there's a QBZ-03 uh, rifle out there. They've, they dropped the bullpup configuration, went back to a standard configuration, but I've never, never seen one in person, much less handled one, much less fired one. So can't really comment about that. Um, there was certainly, there has always been uh, domestic Chinese development that's not bad by any means. Um, things like the Type 63 and the Type 81 were decent rifles, especially the Type 81 that went into product that were fully designed and produced in China. Um, yes, they copied a lot of a lot of guns from other people, especially the Soviets early on um, with the SKS and the AK. But I don't think that necessarily reflects badly. If you you know if it's a good gun and you've got the technical data package, go ahead and use it rather than designing your own thing from scratch. Why not? Uh, hopefully, at some point, I will have a chance to uh, to get some more experience with some of the guns that the Chinese military used, you know, through everything after the AK and the SKS. Um, a favorite and the least favorite. To be honest, not not really. Nothing jumps out at me as particularly good or particularly bad. Well, 
Okay, least favorite is going to be the QBZ95. I really don't like that thing. Uh, Kyle says, could you recommend any channels that specialize in bladed or ancillary weapons? I'd be interested in learning more about subjects like knives and bayonets and spades, but I don't know where to start, and I don't have the budget to collect books on the subject. Nope, I really have no idea. Um, that is not something I put a lot of, I, I have any specialty in, um, and it's not something that I'm regularly looking for on YouTube. So kind of like uh, the, the places to go in Paris, I'll throw this one back to you guys in the audience. Um, if you have any recommend recommendations for particularly knowledgeable and reliable channels on things like bladed weapons, let us know down in the comments. It'd be fun to find some. Uh, Jacob says, were there any successful attempts at making black powder uh, self-loading firearms? Fouling was among the problems, but I'd imagine there probably could have been some semi-successful attempts. To my knowledge, there were cartridges, which would make automatic weapons more possible. Yes, there were absolutely cartridges. Uh, we had cartridges in common use from the 1860s forward, and, and in limited use before that. So by the 1880s, there were people who were experimenting with self-loading, either semi or fully automatic uh, firearms using black powder cartridges. None of them, there were some that were like quasi sort of successful, and in fact the Maxim would be one of those. The original Maxim guns used black powder cartridges, but none of them would have been really militarily viable, simply because of the amount of fouling that black powder produces. So after Maxim developed his machine gun using black powder cartridges, he was, he had turned to working on ways to try and uh, get around powder fouling. He was working on like muzzle devices that would capture fouling so you didn't have a cloud of smoke obscuring your view, different mechanisms for trying to keep guns fireable longer uh, while accumulating black powder fouling in the bores. These were fundamental problems that there was no way around until the invention of smokeless powder. Um, as for other guys who are trying, the other one that comes to mind is uh, Monlicker in 1885 developed a, a semi-automatic rifle using black powder, but I, that never went beyond prototype construction, um, if it even got that far. So I'm sure with really in-depth research you could find a couple other examples of attempted guns, guns where the design was, was good, but these all would have been fundamentally crippled by the black powder. Space Cowboy says, why are East Asian military firearms generally referred to as type as opposed to model, like Western firearms generally are? I can't tell you for Chinese, but I know when it comes to Japanese firearms, that is something that goes way back into the collector circles after World War II, and it is simply based on the translation of the Japanese uh, character or word shiki, um, which is what you'll see marked on Japanese rifles, the Type 99s and Type 38s. They're actually marked 99 shiki, or type. And I've actually heard people suggesting that, people, knowledgeable Japanese speakers, suggesting that type is actually not the best translation, and it should in fact be model. Um, but type is the translation that came into common use, and it's been around so long and so heavily that that's just what we have. It doesn't actually mean anything different, it's just a different translation. Jacob says, in your travels have you ever encountered any weapons that you couldn't figure out the disassembly of on your own? Uh, or were there any that you had to ask help of facility staff to disassemble? Yeah, definitely. I, maybe guns that I would have figured out on my own, given enough time. Uh, but if I'm in a place filming and there's someone there, and it's a complicated gun that it's not clearly obvious how to disassemble, I'm, I'm not egotistical enough to try and bang my own head against a gun just to be able to say that I figured it out myself. If there's someone there who knows how and can show me, that's a faster way to learn the material than, especially when you're talking about older guns where there's the potential to damage things if you try to disassemble it wrong. I'm happy to take assistance from facility staff or collectors or whoever owns the gun in question. A couple of the ones that come to mind specifically are with the, the National Firearms Center in Leeds, the Royal Armories, uh, the AN-94 that we took apart there, um, had substantial assistance from their armor doing that. Um, took apart a bang rifle there at one point. That one didn't get on video because it was just, we ran out of time, frankly, but that I had some assistance on. Um, it's actually not that uncommon. You know, if, if someone already knows and it's a complicated system, I'm, I'm happy to take their help. And our last question is from Garrett, 
who says, from your point of view, which is more advantageous in a submachine gun? Uh, design features, drop safeties, rate reducers, recoil reduction mechanisms, etc., like widgets and features, or simplicity in design and manufacturing process? And I think this is going to tie back into kind of the general theme for a lot of our questions today, which is one of compromise, and what are you trying to do with this submachine gun? If it's 1940 and you're Britain and you're worried about getting invaded, you need a gun that is, above all else, cheap and simple to produce, and you get the Sten gun. On the other hand, if you are Switzerland in the 1930s, go ahead, come up with something that's got all sorts of strange widgets and features and high manufacturing quality, because you've got the time to do it, and a lot of those features do actually have benefit, even if they're not necessarily used all that often. Um, as a general rule, it's a compromise. If you're trying to sell the gun commercially, you need a balance of cool features and cost and efficiency. So I think the best submachine guns that we see do in fact fall into that sort of middle realm. Guns like the MP5, where you have economy of production with stamped receiver and a lot of uh, interchangeability with the G3 rifles that were already in production, at least conceptually, but at the same time you do have a have some really good mechanical features to them, like the, the locked breech closed bolt design. Um, so it all comes down, as with so much in firearms design, it's, it's all compromises. What do you need and what can you give for it? So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this q and I believe this is number 33. We've been doing these for quite a while now. Uh, if you submitted a question and I didn't answer it this time, please feel free to submit it again next time. Uh, I had to, I got more than 10 times as many questions as I was able to actually cover on camera before going completely hoarse. So doesn't mean your question was a bad one, just means I wasn't able to fit it in this time. Thank you all for making Forgotten Weapons possible through your support on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and uh, I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.